24, that's our passage this morning. And when, we le- when we last left the Gospel of John, if you'll remember, Jesus had just healed a man who had uh, been blind from birth. Okay? And this, this man was well known in the community. He was a, a blind beggar. And he would sit at the temple gates and he relied on the charity of those he couldn't see for his existence. He relied on their, their alms and their giving. And when Jesus healed him, all of those who had known him to be blind, were, they were amazed. They were amazed at this healing and they wanted to know how it happened. See, this was not a natural occurrence in, in Israel. We, we read in the Bible all the time about the miracles uh, that take place, and, and I think they become commonplace to us. Jesus does a miracle in the Gospels, and we just kind of go, yeah, that, that's, that's what Jesus does. But Israel, let's keep in mind, Israel was not used to this. This is not something that happened every day on their streets. Um, this kind of powerful working of God was a part of their history, for sure. But if you'll remember, by the time we get to the Gospel of John, it had been four or five generations of people who had never seen anything like this before. They had never seen the works that Jesus had performed. In fact, before the John the Baptist came, they hadn't even heard a prophet of God for 400 years. They hadn't heard the voice of God. And so when Jesus heals a man, everybody, everyone knows is blind from birth. When he had working eyes, when he didn't have them before, his neighbors want to know what happened to him. And if you'll remember in verse 11, he gives this really beautiful, simple explanation. He says, the man called Jesus made mud. He spread it on my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So when I went, I washed and received my sight. Well, we're going to find in our passages, neighbors, they still weren't satisfied. They wanted to know more. And so what they do is they take this man to their religious leaders at the synagogue to the Pharisees. They want to know what their leaders make of this man's healing and what their leaders make of this man, Jesus. And so what we're going to find in our passage today is we're going to encounter a fixed disbelief in the Pharisees. A fixed disbelief. And that's different than unbelief. We'll talk about that in a second. But there's three characteristics we're going to see this morning of the Pharisees' disbelief. And that is that disbelief is stubborn, disbelief is unseeing, and disbelief is hostile. And then after that, I want to talk about doubt for a minute before we close today. So that's where we're headed this morning. That's the road map. uh, So you can kind of see if we're keeping on track. And you'll know when I go off on a rabbit trail, okay? Uh, That's what I tell you. Um, But before we do this, before we get into God's word this morning, um, please, please pray with me. Father, we come to this this moment when you use a sinner who is saved by the glorious grace of Jesus Christ to teach your word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege and for the awesome responsibility. Lord, I pray that my meditations and my preparations would be pleasing to you, Lord. Most of all, I, I pray that our hearts would be open to hear you speak, Lord. Move me out of the way, Lord, and you teach us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I want to go ahead and start off by reading the first couple verses of our passage today. This is verses 13 through 16. And I want us, as we're reading these, to see the difference between disbelief and unbelief. Because they are vastly different. Read verses 13 through 16 with me. They brought the man who used to be blind. What a glorious phrase that is. Who used to be blind to the Pharisees. The day that Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes was a Sabbath. Uh Uh-oh. Y'all know how upset they were when Jesus healed on the Sabbath, don't you? Then the Pharisees asked him again how he received his sight. He'd already been asked by the neighbors. They were already questioning him, so the Pharisees asked him again. He put mud on my eyes, he told them. I washed and I can see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath, talking about Jesus. But others were saying, how can a sinful man perform such signs? And there was a division among them. There was a division among the Pharisees over this healing that Jesus had done. The division is between those who are unbelieving and those who are disbelieving. And that term sounds the same, but it's, it's really very different. See, unbelief, unbelief can be remedied. It can be remedied with belief. But disbelief, disbelief is a fixed 
position of a hard heart that refuses, refuses to believe the truth. Uh, both of them are a product of doubt, but disbelief is a fixed position of a hard heart that refuses to believe the, tru the truth no matter how much evidence would convince you otherwise. And so those of the Pharisees that are, that are unbelieving, they're the ones that are asking the question. They don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but they see what he has done, and they ask the question, how can a sinful man perform these signs? They're struggling in their unbelief. Uh, what they are seeing and what they are experiencing in Jesus is making them question their unbelief. If this man is not the Messiah, if he really is just a sinner and he, he's really just a blasphemer who's trying to deceive all of Israel, how is it that he performs these signs? How does he do that? And this causes division, John tells us, amongst the Pharisees, because there are those of them that are unbelieving, that are unsure about Jesus, but there are also those who are disbelieving. That is, they refuse. They refuse to believe that Jesus is who he is, that, that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that he's God himself, as we've seen him claim. They will not believe the testimony of John the Baptist. They won't believe the testimony of powerful miracles and works that they have seen with their own eyes. They will not believe by his own authoritative teaching that all of Israel, when they heard Jesus teach, said, how does this man teach with such authority? They, they wouldn't believe. His words crash into their hardened hearts and they continue in their disbelief. See, those of the Pharisees that are disbelieving, that refuse to believe, no matter what the evidence shows, we see those characteristics in the rest of our passage. The first one is this. In verses 17 through 24, disbelief, disbelief is stubborn. Read verses 17 through 18 with me. Again, they asked the blind man, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? The blind man responds, he's a prophet, he said. The Jews, now listen, what do you say? You've had experience with him. He has healed you. He's a prophet. They don't want to hear that. They immediately go to, to denying this. Look, the Jews did not believe this about him, about the man. They didn't believe that Jesus was a prophet either, but they're talking about the blind man. The Jews did not believe this about him, that he was blind and received sight until they summoned the parents of the one who had received his sight. So what's your impression? He's a prophet. No, that can't, that can't be right. You must not have been born blind, okay? It must be something else. At this time, keep in mind, the man who has, been, has received his sight doesn't know that Jesus is the Messiah. We'll find out when we come back to John after revival uh, that he does find this out. Um, but right now, there's one thing this man is certain of, that Jesus is a man sent from God. That's why he calls him a prophet. That's what a prophet is. All, all of the prophets throughout Israel's history were men that were sent to accomplish the will of God on earth. And this man's one encounter with Jesus has proven that to him. But the Pharisees, they don't, they don't want to hear this. And so they say, no, that can't be the case. Listen, something else is going on here. We don't believe you were really born blind. That must be it. This must be trickery from, from Jesus. See, their stubborn, disbelieving hearts would not believe the testimony of other people. And so in their refusal to believe the basic facts of this miracle, we, we see their first characteristic of disbelief. They are stubborn. They are unwilling to consider plainly what is before them. A, a man they've all seen begging and, and who multi, the crowd is saying, yeah, that's him. How did he get his sight? And they say, no, this, this must not be the case. Read verses 19 through 21 with me. They call his parents in. They're going to get to the bottom of this. They asked them, is this your son, the one you say was born blind? How then does he now see? We know this is our son and, and that he was born blind. Not something you, you really forget, right? We, we know, his parents answered, but we don't know how he now sees, and we don't know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. See, the Pharisees call his parents in for questioning to prove their suspicion that this man wasn't really born blind, but they affirm, yes, this is our son. Uh, yes, he, he was born blind, but then they say they don't know how it happened. 
Why, why do you think that is? Listen, undoubtedly, their son had told them, don't you think? But keep in mind, this isn't the same day that he was healed. The day that this man was healed, John's already told us, is the Sabbath. And so the Pharisees weren't going to hold court on the Sabbath. They might have been hypocrites, but they weren't going to be a hypocrite in the way they were trying to condemn Jesus because they wanted to use that to kill him. Undoubtedly, their son had told them, as everyone else had, had been talking about it, what had happened to him, that, that Jesus had healed them. Why won't they say what they most likely know? Look at verses 22 through 23 with me. His parents said these things because they were afraid of the Jews. Since the Jews had already, listen, before they find out what's really going on, the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him as the Messiah, he would be banned from the synagogue. This is why his parents said that he's of age. Go and ask him. See, they, they were afraid. Because the disbelieving Pharisees, not only were they unwilling to believe the truth about Jesus, but they also suppressed the truth about Jesus. They didn't want anyone else to believe either. You ever notice uh, so-called atheists are extremely passionate to disprove the God they don't believe exists? You ever notice that? Some people spend their entire lives trying to prove how God doesn't exist. But if you don't believe he exists, why would you waste your time? Listen, I don't believe unicorns exist. I don't go down to Main Street Lakeview and hold a sign that says, unicorns don't exist. And I don't talk to people about it because I don't have to. We know they don't exist. I don't have any problems with that. Disbelief doesn't just not believe themselves, but it also suppresses the truth about Jesus. They're stubborn in that way as well. Anyone that was found giving credence to this claim that Jesus was the Messiah would be banned from the synagogue. And really to understand the gravity of that situation, you have to understand that the synagogue was the community gathering place for the Jews. You, you could go to the temple and sacrifice, but where all the people, the people interaction, where, where the kinship with your fellow brothers and sisters in Israel happened was in the synagogue. To be excluded from the synagogue would be to be excluded from the community that they turn their back on you. You'd be an outcast among your own people. In a way, you'd be excluded from, from practicing your own faith. It's not like today where there, there was like a synagogue in every corner. You couldn't just leave this synagogue because you, you didn't like what the teacher said or you didn't like what they did with the building and go to the synagogue down the street. Uh, there, there were one synagogue in communities. You, you'd have to move your whole life if the news didn't travel with you. So this was a big deal. So much so that these parents won't even talk plainly about what happened to their son. They say, listen, he's, he's old enough. We don't want to answer this question. You go and, and talk to him. Let him answer the question. If he wants to tell the truth and be banned, he can do that. Disbelief is so stubborn that it suppresses the expression of different beliefs. It suppresses the expression of different beliefs. Well, is that a bad thing, you think? to suppress the expression of different beliefs? Uh, isn't there only one true God? Yeah, there is. That's true. There's only one true God. So, so wouldn't it be good for us to suppress other beliefs? You think anybody comes to Christ because you suppress their beliefs? No. No. Listen, there, there might be different beliefs. And yes, there is one true God. That's true. But we shouldn't suppress. We should be willing to speak to others about their different beliefs and then to have an answer for what we know is the truth, okay? Don't be afraid of different beliefs. If, if you know that God is God, and you know what Christ has done in your heart, don't be afraid to communicate with people in your lives that might not believe that. As society goes the way it does, and as statistics show us year by year what the, the church looks like and what our country looks like, you're going to have people that don't believe this at all. Don't hide from that. Don't be unwilling to engage them in where they believe. Talk to them and then tell them the truth. Have the courage to stand there and tell them what you believe. And make sure you know what you believe. Kind of hard to do that if you can't articulate it. Disbelief is, is so stubborn that it suppresses the expression. They said, if you even say he's the Messiah, you're out. We're going to ban you from the synagogue. They would not consider 
that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, they wouldn't allow anyone else to consider it either, not without punishing them. And so as parents, they're, they're fearing for themselves, they pass the buck to their son. And so they summon the man back, they, they summon his parents, Okay, they know that he was blind and that he can now see. They know that his neighbors say that Jesus had healed him. They know that he says Jesus had healed him. And read verse 24 with me. So a second time, that plan didn't pan out for him. The parents did confirm he was blind and now obviously he can see. So a second time, they summoned the man who had been blind and they told him, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. You know what give glory to God means? I mean, stop lying. They've heard the testimony. His own parents who are fearing to be thrown out are saying, yeah, this happened. We don't know how it happened, but it happened. And they bring him back in and they say, listen, we don't care about the evidence. We don't care about the facts. You give glory to God. You stop lying right now. We already know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Do you see how disbelieving they are? how unwilling to move off that position that they are. They were stubbornly resolute in their disbelief. We also see in our next verses here that disbelief is not just stubborn, it's also unseeing. It's unseeing, unable to see what is right before them. They still don't believe. They're, they're persisting in their disbelief. Read verses 25 through 26 with me. So they yell at him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Now, he doesn't have a lot of contact with Jesus, remember. He answered, whether or not he's a sinner, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't spent any time with him. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I can see. I, I, that's my encounter with Jesus. That's why I think he's a prophet. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? You guys ever watch crime shows, CSI or anything like that, okay? You, you notice in those shows that they'll get a witness or a suspect and several different police will ask them the same questions over and over again. Tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. Tell me what happened. And they do this because they're, they're trying to catch them in a lie, right? They're trying to catch them in a lie, trying to determine if they know the truth. And that's what these Pharisees are doing. They're, they're asking again. They've already asked them how it happened. But they, they ask them again. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? They're trying to see if, if maybe he's lying, if they can find something in his recount of this story that would let them keep their disbelief. And so they ask him the same questions again. And now this man, listen, he's probably getting pretty frustrated. Could you imagine? You can't see, okay? You spend your whole life on a corner, on a mat, or holding on to a wall trying to get people to give you money. And then nobody believes it. They drag you to court, okay, and then they don't believe it. They keep asking you the same questions over and over again. You just want to go look at a bird or something. You've never seen one. Could you imagine being this guy? Can you imagine how frustrated? I would be so frustrated. You start to see that, I think, as they ask him again. What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Look what he says in verses 27 through 29. Let me, let me just actually start verse 27. I'm going to put some emphasis on this, how I think he said it, okay? There aren't little italics in the Bible that tell you, but we can kind of surmise. I already told you, he said, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? It's very important. Do you, do you notice what he said? This man already considers himself a disciple of Jesus. He doesn't know that Jesus is the Messiah yet, but he wants to follow him. He wants to follow the man who, who gave him his sight. The man considers himself already to be a disciple of Jesus. All he knows is he wants to follow this man. And this is a beautiful picture, church. I, I think that this is a beautiful picture of being able to trust Jesus without knowing everything. Some people have to know every detail about everything that they're going to do before they'll feel comfortable doing it. One of my sons is like this. I'm not going to tell you which one it is, okay? It's not Nehemiah. Uh, one of my sons is like this. <laughs> If we're going to go somewhere and we're going to do something, he wants to know where we're going, when we're going, what we're going to do, when we're going to get home. And our motto when we go in the car on trips is go with the flow. Stop asking us so many questions, right? Go with the flow. It's because it's the questions are annoying. They are. He's just a kid, though. It's not really, that's not really the point. The most important thing is I want my son to trust me. 
I, I want my son to know that I'm not going to take him somewhere that isn't good for him. He doesn't have to know everything to follow his daddy. See, this is the picture we get in, the ver in, in verse 27 with this man. He doesn't know that much about Jesus, but he trusts him. He's a disciple. He means to follow Jesus because Jesus is the one who gave him his sight. In, in church, I wonder this morning if sometimes our relationship with God is, is more like my son's relationship with me on car trips than it is with this man who received his sight. Do you trust God? Do we trust him? Or do you, do you need to know everything in advance before you'll move? Where are you taking me, God? Why are you doing this, God? What's going to happen, God? God, how can this be? We've all been there. We've all said those words. Listen, I want to encourage you this morning to believe. Believe that the Father who gave up his own son for you loves you. That he has your best in mind and you can trust him. Listen, you can trust him even when the storm is raging all around you. You're in that storm for a reason, and you can trust your Father in heaven while you're in it. You don't have to have all the questions answered before you follow God. Amen? Verses 28 and 29, he continues talking. They, res they don't respond well to this, uh, the way that he's talking to them now. 28 and 29, they ridiculed him. We're not going to become his disciples. Listen, they ridiculed, ridiculed him. You're that man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's from. We don't know anything about him, okay? And, and what we're about to see is these, these, listen, these Pharisees, they had already seen far more than this blind man had ever seen or experienced of Jesus, hadn't they? They had seen the mighty works of Christ. Uh, they, they could not see what was plainly before them, though. Their disbelief had blinded them. They were unseeing. And it's ironic that the blind man gains his sight while those who always had their physical sight, they become inwardly blind, right? The Holy Spirit's warning against a hardened heart describes well these Pharisees. Look what Hebrews 3, 7 through 11 says. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked to anger with that generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts, and they have no, not known my ways. So I swore in my anger they will not enter my rest. Church, we don't want to harden our hearts when we hear the voice of the Lord. Amen? We want to be those who will move when we hear. And this, this is important as we go into revival, church. Listen, I, I hope you're getting excited about revival. I, I don't know if you are, but we need to understand, just like every time uh, we stand here and I preach, the Lord knew billions of years ago where we'd be in the text, where you'd be in your life, the state of your heart, and he has a word for us every time we gather around this word for you to apply in your life. So we better believe that revival, when Brother Unger comes, to preach to us that the God has something for you personally. Amen? Pray for it. Expect it. Be ready for it. Third, third characteristic we see. Disbelief is arrogant. It's vastly arrogant. Let me, let me just set the scene. We're going to read verses 30 through 33 in just a second. But, but realize what's happening here. This blind beggar, who we know is not held in high esteem, we, we remember that Israel had this false belief that if you were living that way, if you were maligned physically, if you were a beggar, that the reason was because you were cursed by God and you were lowly. We know that that's not correct. But this blind beggar who now sees is standing before the creme de la creme of religious authority in their community. And, and he is seeking to teach them. Do you, do you get the picture? Can you feel their indignance? How they'd feel about this? They would not take kindly what he was saying. Look at verses 30 through 33 with me. They say, we're Moses' disciples. We don't know where this man Jesus is from. And I think at this point, if you look at the explanation points in your Bible, I think this man's amazed, maybe even a little upset. Listen to what he says. You don't know where he's from? This is an amazing thing, the man told them. You, you don't know where he is from? 
and yet he opened my, my eyes? We know, we know, we agree that, that God doesn't listen to sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing, if he's God-fearing, if he loves the Lord and he honors the Lord with his life, we know that, it, that he does his will and that God listens to that man. And throughout history, throughout all of history, we know that no one has ever heard of someone having their eyes opened when they've been born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. And he's making a, passion, a passionate argument. He says, we agree that God doesn't listen to sinners. We agree that God listens to those who please him. We, we know this has never happened before in our history, and yet it has happened. So how can we not know where he is from? We shouldn't be banning people from the synagogue for following him. We should be following him. And the Pharisee's response in verse 34. Listen, they should have been humbled by this. This should have put them back. They should have said, you're right. Something is going on with this man, Jesus, that we're not quite sure of. But it's from God, obviously. That's what, that's what should have happened. Look at verse 34 with me. It's not how they respond. You were born entirely in sin, they replied. And are you trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. And that verb that goes with they threw him out, it implies the same thing they said about the parents. They banned him from the synagogue. They weren't going to have a lowly beggar teach them. And so they throw him out because he would not join them in their hatred and their disbelief of Jesus. And so as, as, as we close today, as I'm trying to finish here, I want us to consider something. How did they get this way? How did the Pharisees get like this? And church, let's not think that we're above being drawn into something like this. How do we guard against this kind of fixed disbelief in our lives? We've seen that disbelief is a hardened, fixed attitude of the heart. Listen, that it actively works against believing something. Unbelief is not sure. Unbelief says, I, I could possibly believe, I just don't right now. Disbelief says, I'm not going to believe. You won't convince me, okay? no matter what the experience is. It, it, disbelief, what disbelief is, is it starts with doubt. Disbelief is the re end result of unchecked doubt, of doubt that we don't address. See, doubt turns into unbelief. And unbelief can turn into disbelief. And, and so I want to make a statement about doubt and disbelief. Just, just something to understand. This is so doubt and disbelief. This is a part of the human experience. We, we could all raise our hands and say at some point we've had doubts, right? Doubts about all kinds of things. But, but doubt and disbelief is only as serious as the thing that you are doubting and disbelieving in, right? Like if you disbelieve the Loch Ness Monster or you disbelieve Bigfoot, that's not a big deal, okay? That doesn't really matter. If you don't believe that, if, if all the, the casted footprints out of the woods and the, the fuzzy images of the Loch Ness Monster don't convince you uh, and you, you're wrong about that, if you get to heaven and you go, oh, turns out I was wrong. Bigfoot was real, right? That doesn't matter because, because doubt and disbelief is only as serious as what you are doubting and disbelieving, right? That's not a, that's not a big thing. But if your doubt is about God. Listen, and you let that doubt grow, and you don't address that doubt, it will fester and grow into unbelief. Your, your doubts will start to become your beliefs, and you won't believe certain things anymore. Your heart will no longer believe what God's Word says, or what the preacher says, or, or what you used to believe. And, and the more doubt you entertain, church, the more doubt you add on top of your unbelief, the harder and harder it gets until your unbelief becomes so strong that it becomes something else entirely disbelief and you become fixed in that and you're no longer skeptical and doubting but you're sure that God is not real or, or that if he is real that he's not good or, or that he's there but he's unknowable and really the Bible is, is just a bunch of hogwash from people who are too afraid to have an open mind it starts with doubt 
that kind of doubt is very serious. When you die and stand before God, you won't simply shrug your shoulders and say, oh, I was wrong. Jesus will say, I never knew you, and you'll spend eternity in hell. If that's where it gets, if that's where your doubt goes to, disbelief of Christ and that this is true. Listen, unresolved, unresolved doubt is a dangerous problem, but it's a common problem, church. If you have doubts about God, you have doubts about that things in this Bible, you're in good company. All throughout the Bible, Moses doubted, Abraham doubted, the disciples doubted, Peter doubted, Peter denied, right? So, so don't think you're by yourself. Listen, I don't want to scare you about your doubt. That's not what I'm trying to do. Uh, if you doubt, it's because you're human, okay? That, to, to doubt is to be human. You, you have probably doubted him at some time. You've most likely doubted him amongst the pain in your life. Maybe right now in your life, you are doubting and it's getting the best of you. I don't want you to hear the pastor is saying that if I doubt, um, I'm going to go to hell. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that, that doubt is a normal part of our walk in faith as we try to reconcile ourselves and the world we see with God's word. Doubt is normal. Okay? But it's not acceptable. It's a normal thing. But it's not something that we just accept and that we don't address in our hearts because unchecked doubt can become hardened disbelief. And so as we close, I want to say three things. Three ways to deal with doubt. Because it's going to happen, church. It's going to happen for various reasons. Because of that, because God is so awesome and he's so big and it's sometimes hard for us to understand who he is and what he's done. It's going to happen because we're, we're in a war. The Bible says that. There's an enemy who hates you because he hates God. And he wants you to doubt. He wants you in disbelief. So you're, you're going to come up with doubt in your heart at some point. And so here's three things I think that we can do to deal with doubt. Number one, don't doubt in isolation. Don't doubt in isolation. Talk about your doubts with other brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? Odds are you're not alone in them. Someone has probably had the same doubt before that you're having now. And they've come out of it and they can help you. Listen, we're not meant to live the Christian lives in isolation, church. And if all we do is gather here on Sunday morning, and maybe on Wednesday night, and we've got nothing to do with each other's lives otherwise, you're in isolation. If there aren't people in this congregation, this body of Christ, that you're comfortable talking with your doubts about, brother or sister, you're living in isolation. And you don't have to. Don't do that. Listen, we are together the body of Christ. We are together the family of God. Be open about your doubts. Seek, seek the prayers and the conversation of other mature followers because the enemy loves to convince us to keep our fears and doubts to ourselves and he loves to help us believe that no one else has these doubts don't, don't talk about this because no one else has these doubts and, and then they'll think badly of you he knows that in isolation we're weak but we're strong amongst the community and the body of Christ so don't listen to the enemy listen and God already knows doesn't he he already knows your doubts doesn't he he does Talk to him. Speak plainly about it. Pray about them. Tell him what you're having trouble believing. And ask him to give you a heart that'll believe. Okay? So number one, don't doubt in isolation. Number two, to fight your doubts when they arise, gain an accurate picture of God. Sometimes, listen church, sometimes the answer to our doubts is simply because he's God. Okay? How, how can he part the Red Sea? Because he's God. Okay? How, how can he really forgive me knowing everything I've done? Because he's God. Well, how, how, can, he, how can he know all things and see all things and, and be in all places? Because he's God. Okay? The answer is unsatisfying to us because oftentimes we have a very low view of God and a high view of ourselves. I have trouble believing this because I can't understand it, is what happens. My dad talked to me about this one time. I was talking to him early in my faith about doubts. I got saved, you guys know, most of you, when I was 16, 17. And so I didn't grow up in the church and I had doubts about what I was reading. And he told me it like this. If you open a math book, son, 
and you understand the first four or five chapters, right? But you don't understand the six that follow after it. You don't think those chapters are wrong. You believe those are right because you understand the beginning, right? I, I know that two plus two equals four because I can understand that. But when we start talking about calculus and trigonometry and advanced physics and, and math, that escapes me. I don't understand that. That is not how the Lord blessed me. I have no idea what you're talking about, okay? If you held a gun to my head and said, solve for X, I'd be a dead man in heaven, all right? Just want you to know that. But it's very possible, church, that, that your doubt is being fueled by your pride. If I can't understand how God could do, do X, Y, or Z, if I can't understand the mind and the heart of God completely, then I'm not going to believe it. That's pride, church. Jesus is God. And I am not. God is God and we are not. Some things, church, have to be accepted on faith. And not, I'm not saying don't think about them, but things have to be accepted on faith and then you explore them in your belief. Okay? This brings us to our third and final thing that we can do when doubts arise in our lives. Wield your weapon. Okay? Ephesians 6.17 calls the Bible God's word and the sword of the spirit. And so, church, swing your sword. In the battle against your doubts, swing your sword. Pick up God's word and read it. Listen, make a regular, daily practice of reading God's word. And I, I know I say this all the time. I've been saying it to you for over a year now, and I'm just going to keep on doing it. You know why? Because it's so simple and it's so neglected amongst the body of Christ. Listen, as we regularly read God's word, as we, as we swing the sword, you become better versed in using it, and it will be a true weapon against your doubts. When a doubt arises, you'll know what God's word says, and you'll believe it. Okay? It's a weapon, but it's absolutely useless if you don't use it. Okay? If someone is breaking into my home and I have an unloaded gun, I can throw it at them. Right? Right? It's going to make them angrier. <laughs> it's useless. If it's not loaded and ready to go, okay? You can only blast them out the front door if you're cocked and ready to go. Not that I would... Listen, don't come to my house if I don't know you're coming, okay? Just letting you know. <laughs> listen, church, take all of your doubts and hold them up to the word of God and then believe God's word over your doubt. Start from that place. Don't go to God's word saying, Lord, prove to me that you're right. You go and say, Lord, I know you're right. Show me. Be, be like the, the man who said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Go to the Lord with your doubts. Believe God's word over your own thoughts, okay? Your own doubts. So, so unchecked doubt can grow into something truly terrible, which is fixed disbelief. Okay. If we're going to be God's people who fulfill his work that he's called us to do, we must guard our hearts against disbelief, and we must deal with our doubts. Amen? Pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you are not a God that just calls us to...